Hello everyone and welcome back to day 48 of Bitwise, where we uh, code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So um, in the last five streams, I guess it was, um, we, uh, or I rather, did some kind of exploratory programming in Python, both for myself to get uh, back into the swing of things and uh, kind of stir my, my, my memory of that stuff that I did a year plus ago, uh, and also for people who are new to Python to maybe ease into it. but um, it wasn't really a structured, um, even though it involved some hardware things, it wasn't really an introduction to those concepts or anything like that. So um, starting today, I'm going to, I guess, move formally to the hardware design part of, uh, of the Bitwise series. Um, today, starting with a, um, I guess, a softer intro to, to at a very high level, some of the concepts and, and ideas, uh, especially if you're coming from a software perspective, um, and also I think talking about the roadmap so that people have an idea, um, kind of where we're going and some of the stops along the way and stuff like that, um, and also so people can ask questions. Um, but uh, today is going to be uh, be that sort of thing, I guess, kind of like when we did the original stream for Ion. I, I talked about a bunch of um, uh, a, a bunch of reasons for why we were doing what we were doing and what we were hoping to accomplish and stuff like that. So uh, something in the similar vein, um, but you know, not focused on a specific, uh, say, programming language like Ion was. Not not that sort of thing, but just talking about those kind of general decisions and why why I plan to do things the way I'm doing it. Um, and so um, uh, that that's kind of the main purpose of the day. And then uh, starting with the next stream. We, we basically moved down that roadmap, um, starting with kind of logic design. So um, let's begin a new file here. Um, so I, I guess first I should emphasize that um, when I'm talking about hardware design, uh, I mean, caveat number one, I'm, I'm fundamentally a software guy um, and I am, uh, you know, this is only really something I've started uh, doing in uh, like the hardware side of things. It's only something I've really been doing the last couple of years, and it's been purely in a hobby capacity. Um, but um, so, so I'm coming at it from that perspective of someone who, uh, you know, unlike some of the most of the systems programming stuff we've done so far. Actually, a lot of the systems programming we've covered has also been things that are not formally kind of part of my professional resume. Um, but but even so, that stuff that's definitely, if you, if you look at my background, is more obviously in my wheelhouse. Uh, hardware design is much uh, is something I'm much newer to, and so I can cl I can claim even less authority and expertise there. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, I, I guess I, I feel comfortable enough with it at this point that I can um, hopefully hopefully present it in a way that makes sense to software people. Um, and I guess that's the other benefit, kind of coming from a software perspective. I, I still have that um, recollection of, of what I found counterintuitive and, and things like that. So hopefully that will help um, help making uh, at least people coming from a software perspective understand this stuff better. Um, when I'm talking about hardware design, I'm also not talking about, I mean, and, and, and so it's a kind of a, I'm, I'm going to use the word hardware design, but I, but realize that it's a bit of a misnomer. I'm not going to talk about, you know, designing circuit boards or, uh, or all that stuff about making a final, you know, piece of hardware, like an actual, you know, a hardware product that, uh, not even in prototype form. Um, uh, the stuff I'm really going to be focusing on is, um, you know, kind of things connected to logic design, uh, sort of, you know, the, the 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 part of hardware design that is uh, that is amenable to the kinds of design approaches that we're fairly used to in in software, um, and uh, you know so so that's kind of my perspective. So uh, you know focus on on logic design uh, mostly uh, mostly digital uh, analog where needed, um, and um, my my perspective is. Uh, Uh, you know, from someone who, so, um, so, so that, so that's, um, I think that's important to understand. Um, let me talk a little bit about, um, kind of goals in terms of like, um, 
what kinds of, of end goals we want to have, um, like specific things we want to be able to implement. So I mentioned a bunch of these in the original uh, document. If you, uh, if I can open it up. Um, you know, uh, implement uh, simple CPUs, uh, starting with single cycle core, um, moving to simple uh, to, to simple pipeline CPUs. Um, so, in other words, uh, at, a, at, a, at a level of abstraction that I'll cover later. Uh, being able to to implement a to sign and implement a simple CPU, um, starting with a single cycle core. So single cycle is basically just it's it's a kind of CPU design which uh, is is as about as non pipelined as it can be, um, but is it's pretty inefficient. It's not very efficient. Doesn't exploit um, much uh, sort of internal. Uh, you know, doesn't doesn't exploit the parallelism that's pretty basically exploited by by even simple cores nowadays universally. Um, but then moving to, to to more complicated designs later. But starting with very simple stuff, so um, um, so we can kind of get our our foothold there. Um, and uh, um, uh, S starting with, uh, so yeah, we obviously we need peripherals as well. So a CPU is one thing, but it needs to somehow connect to the outside world. Um, um, moving to, so yeah, and and kind of the universal, about, about the universally simplest interface that people use in practice for this is a UART, which, um, you know, if, uh, if if you grew up in the, uh, in the same era as I did, this is what people called like basically what people called a serial port um, back in the days, where um, you have uh, typically full duplex. You know, you have uh, between the two uh, endpoints, you have a, a, a transmit line going one direction, a receive line going in the other direction, and you can transmit and receive concurrently. And those are single bit lines, and the data that's sent over that is byte oriented. So even though a single bit moves over at a time they are reconstituted, they're serialized and deserialized into bytes. Uh, and so this is basically just serial byte IO. And, that, and, and given, given that, you can basically have a simple terminal interface to, um, to your CPU. So this is the simplest, the first thing you really want to do um, if, if you're trying to, um, like the, the first real IO peripheral. You, you can have even simpler stuff like simple LEDs or whatever or simple push buttons that control some aspect of say initialization or can visualize um, some some internal state. But uh, the first real IO peripheral you want to implement is a UART and that's the, going to be the first thing we implement as well. Um, but, but then uh, moving to more complicated things um, like uh, a display generator, meaning uh, something that generates a display signal for an external display, uh, initially VGA, uh, later HDMI. Uh, and I'll, I'll call it an audio generator. Um, um, and this is, you know, the same sort of thing, but being able to generate audio, uh, or I, actually, I guess, um, uh, let me mention these. So, uh, also a keyboard and mouse, um, if you're if you're okay with just using a UART um, to connect, you know, with a remote terminal, uh, you can do that. But but also keyboard and mouse, and uh, we're going to be using PS2, which uh, nowadays is not really used in, in PCs anymore. Um, that got phased out in favor of USB. But um, PS the, the PS2 protocol, which goes back to the original IBM PCs, is uh, is a relatively simple protocol. Uh, unlike USB, which is very complicated, and so uh, some of the recommended FPGA boards we'll be using actually have uh, basically USB to PS2 converters, so that on board things are converted to a PS2 signal. So that from our perspective, writing stuff for an FPGA, um, we will um, we will be able to just deal with PS2. So that's uh, another thing we'll want to do, um, and then. Um, 
basically between the display generator and uh, even, I mean, mouses maybe you can skip initially if you want to, but given a display generator and keyboard, you can basically have an untethered computer. Untethered meaning it's directly connected to, um, you know, to a display uh, and, you know, probably initially via a VGA to HDMI converter, um, but later directly to via HDMI uh, and a keyboard. Uh, and again, uh, USB through a, a USB to PS2 converter. And, uh, and you have sort of an untethered system at that point. Whereas if you're using a UART, you're, you're going to have to use some remote terminal software on another PC. So that's kind of a tethered setup where you, um, I mean, anyway, so uh, th those are the uh, the initial set of things. And uh, then sort of, I guess, in the next tier is where I would put audio. Um, you can do simple things with audio very, uh, uh, very easily. Um, and uh, I think the, the two boards I'll recommend have easy options for that. Um, but, uh, you know, basically doing simple PCM stuff um, where, you know, you can play a sample buffer. Um, and maybe it doesn't even do any mixing, but uh, just directly plays a single buffer and you do all mixing on the uh, in your own logic. Um, so, um, so stuff like that. So I'm not going to make an exhaustive list, but that's the kind of... the uh, the, the kind of things we will do in terms of that. Um, uh, this will be done in simulation um, and deployed on FPGAs, but um, but most of the the, the design principles uh, are fairly universal. And so what I mean by that is, uh, you know. The, the sort of two options we have for realizing these uh, implementations is, of course, we can simulate them, which uh, is very convenient. Uh, and uh, in terms of what would you might say actual hardware deployment, it's going to be on FPGAs, which, uh, you know, is, it's arguable. It, it's a form of programmable hardware. It lies somewhere between the conventional CPUs, which are, of course, programmable as well, right? Software programmable and something like an ASIC, uh, like a real custom chip design. But um, uh, but, uh, but 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 beyond, but aside from that, I mean, like most of the design principles are universal. The way logic design uh, works is fairly universal. The kind of things that change is, um, I mean, the the stakes are obviously very different when you're designing chips. It's a very expensive process to to, to tape out a chip and all that stuff. Um, but if you're not worried about super high performance, for example, um, then most of these things transfer, you know, and the same, the same basic, you know, the same hardware description languages uh, are used in both cases uh, and so on. So uh, I'm not going to claim that anything we'll be covering is uh, sort of directly transferable to doing, you know, quote unquote, real chip design, but um, it's, it's the basic principles are definitely transferable as long as you keep in mind that, um, you know, that, uh, that, that, that you won't, we won't be validating any of that stuff, right? Like we'll be working in simulation and on FPGAs. Um, and I guess even to move up, uh, to, to even get to this point, um, uh, teach uh, logic design basics, starting with um, combinational logic, uh, what's called combinational logic and uh i wonder if i can bring up some wikipedia pages just to be in the background as i'm talking about stuff um so so, so what in circuit design is called combinational logic is what i think from a software perspective you should think of as being kind of purely functional code in a sense it's stuff that's computing uh, an input output relationship. So given a, a fixed set of inputs, you're always gonna get the same set of outputs. So there's no hidden internal state or anything like that. It's fully a fully explicit input to output relationship. Um, um, And um, the the kind of design plus discipline we're going to be using is essentially, uh, which is what is universally used, right? Pretty much, is you start with combinational logic as the core thing, which is you know uh, 
again, I think if you're coming from software, the right, there's a, there are a ton of analogies to doing purely functional programming. You then, um, you know, of, of course, in the real world, as soon as you're dealing with uh, pretty much any problem, you start wanting to do what's called sequential logic, which is um, where there's some notion of state, some some notion of state, um, where you know, for example, if you have uh, like a state machine is the most obvious example. You have something where over time, as things step, there, there's a notion uh, there, there's a notion of of a clock. Which steps at regular intervals, which uh, you know, if you if you're coming from, you know, the game world is kind of like the the you know the, the game loop tick that advances the state, um, and every tick, the the state of the machine, or at least in that clock domain, advances synchronously, uh, and so the next state is a function of the previous state and any inputs that are maybe externally provided, and um, but but the function that computes the next state in terms of the current state and the current inputs, that part is purely functional. And so it's a way of sort of factoring out um, the, the, the state storage elements from the, from the logic that defines how a state machine behaves. Um, and so um, the, the state transition function that describes how the state evolves over time as a function of the current state and the current inputs, uh, that part is essentially, that's combinational, that's purely functional. Uh, and so, that's that's essentially where all the action is. Um, but learning to design state machines, uh, in I mean, in theory, that's what almost all of us do when we're writing software code because uh, there's an implicit state machine when it, with a program counter that steps sequentially through a bunch of instructions and so on. But it turns out that um, when you're uh, when you're designing state machines for hardware, um, it's often uh, it, I, I think that was the biggest stumbling block for me coming from um, from software as someone who had done a bunch of functional programming and was sort of comfortable with that way of, of designing stuff, but then coming designing state machines and especially how do you design in bigger complicated state machines? How do you compose uh, bigger state machines out of smaller state machines and stuff like that? Uh, I think that's going to be uh, getting a handle on that and getting uh, getting comfortable designing kind of bigger complicated controls, uh, control systems um, with state machines is going to be, uh, I think, one of the big uh, stumbling blocks for software people. But um, at the same time, I mean, the concept of a state machine is obviously familiar to software people as well. So it's not like a, a foreign concept. It's just that it's the way you have to do it um, when you're doing hardware stuff is, is highly explicit compared to what you're doing uh, in software. Some things are actually easier in hardware when it comes to this stuff, but most things are harder in my experience. So. Um, we're going to, to basically lay that foundation before we can get to this stuff. Um, and so before we can get to this, um, cover sort of uh, textbook basics like uh, data path, uh, data path circuits, uh, adders, etc. Um, and um, this is so, some of this stuff is kind of necessary to uh, to get to the point where we can do some of this, uh, like design a simple CPU or uh, design a simple uh, I/O peripheral like a UART. But um, these two phases here, I'm going to spend a bunch of time on rather than just racing to the finish. Like I could, I was considering for a while uh, taking the shortest possible path to writing, you know, a simple CPU with a UART just to sort of give people, you know, showing people how simple it can be done to get from A to B in the shortest possible uh, amount of time. But I think given that a lot of people don't have any kind of logic design background who will be watching this, I think that's uh, a bad idea. Um, and so I am going to spend uh, a decent amount of time covering uh, this stuff here, um, but, but in an accelerated way, but covering a lot of the stuff that people would normally cover in textbooks, but just covering it, I would say extremely quickly kind of taking advantage of, uh, of, the, of the way uh, our own custom HDL will be working to express a lot of these things very concisely. Um, uh, uh, sign a hardware description language uh, based on these ideas. So I'm just gonna interpolate some of these things like uh, in, in terms of the rough order. So this will be sort of concurrent with, uh, like the, the, the HDL stuff will be mostly concurrent with this progression in the sense that in order to talk about logic design, you need a language. 
And conventionally, of course, I mean, there's a, basically there's Boolean algebra, there's notations like that. Um, and there's also, you know, graphical schematics, which is uh, how you often see this stuff described in textbooks. I personally find schematics not the most helpful. Um, and they're certainly not useful for, they're not too, terribly useful for entry. Um, and they're hard to, they don't work well for describing stuff that's parameterized, like that's generic. Um, and so uh, for the most part, as, as we go forward here, we'll be, um, uh, we'll be basically designing and implementing our own language. And this is kind of what I, I showed pieces of the last five streams that, that kind of uh, express those concepts. And we'll be using our own language to express them and visualize them and analyze them and so on. Um, and um, uh, so that's going to be a major part of it. Um, and th this will include you know, um, um, So yeah, this is going to include, include a whole pipeline. Most of these elements will be pretty simple. Like I already showed how to uh, how to implement something like a graph is, wet graph with a visualizer, which if you don't recall, we can use to, to do stuff like this. Here's a really dumb floating point adder, only does unsigned, uh, only does truncation, not rounding. But anyway, uh, th this is generated from, uh, this is generated from, from this kind of code uh, using that, uh, Graph with generator, graph whiz generator, and uh, tools like that we're going to build on top of the language. So there's going to be the language itself, which is mostly just about expressing structure. Uh, essentially, you can think of it as a way of of of, of writing, you know, of, of expressing uh, schematics in some way, um, but doing it in code. Uh, and then you, there's a bunch of tools that can process that, so you can visualize it with something like graph whiz. You can do analysis. Uh, it, you can compute some notion of some kind of cost metric, max delay, or whatever, um, if you want to. Uh, you can simulate it. Um, and importantly, if we want to target FPGAs, for example, or, or even ASICs, like quote unquote real chips, uh, code generators that will target um, uh, other HDLs uh, as intermediate languages, basically, like Verilog in our case, which you can then feed to a, uh, like a proprietary tool chain that. Um, that, that, that only accepts you know Verilog or VHDL or some other standard language like that. Um, but uh, a good question is like, why don't we write Verilog directly or VHDL directly? And um, I, I had sort of oscillated on that um, for a while uh, when we, before I started the project. And uh, I think doing it this way, it gives you more leverage. Like Verilog is actually, a, I, I think has some very nice uh, like it, it has its upsides and downsides. If you're going to work in industry, you absolutely have to learn Verilog or VHDL, probably Verilog these days. But um, I think as a teaching tool, it has problems. One is that it's based on a semantics that is fundamentally simulation. That's sort of uh, imperative, basically. It's sort of concurrent imperative semantics. And um, the fact that a certain subset can be synthesized into a net list that describes a circuit is almost incidental. I mean, it wasn't even designed for that. Designed for that originally, it was designed to do simulation, beha like behavioral simulation, um, not to describe synthesizable, uh, uh, you know, processes or whatever the Verilog terminology is. Um, so, um, I, I, I think Verilog, you can, you could, you, you can teach a subset of it that has sane behavior. And I'm going to have to sort of, but by necessity, cover a little bit of that as we're writing the code generator and 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 uh, and also interfacing with other Verilog code. But I think keeping things uh, kind of in our own domain means that we have, uh, you know, we, we have a very clear sense of, of what things mean. And uh, the foundation of our HDL is going to be what's called sometimes structural, uh, st structural RTL code, which means it's basically, like I said before, it's a way of describing uh, schematics. It's a way of describing circuit structure rather than behavior. Uh, and then later on, we'll add um, 
we'll, we'll add features to the language that are behavioral, like like for things that are when you're designing state machines that are helpful for that and stuff like that, uh, which will um, which will sort of be added progressively. But we'll start with structural structural RTL like code, um, but in a way that's much more expressive than what you're probably used to if you've done Verilog or VHDL, because uh, you can do, I mean, you can absolutely do structural stuff in Verilog, um, but it doesn't have great features uh, for doing that. Like it doesn't have, uh, until recently, it didn't have, uh, until System Verilog, it didn't have like, for example, something like structs. Um, and even now it doesn't, anyway, uh, not, not not to get sidetracked by that, but uh, you, you'll, you'll see. So, th so, um, this is very much not targeted at getting people to be, you know, industry ready, whatever, um, uh, chip designers or FPGA designers. This is really focused on trying to teach the concepts. And, uh, as I think it's becoming evident, I think it's important to, um, I mean, this, this is sort of opinionated, but I, I, I like the idea that you're kind of, you're implementing the language and this and the semantics via simulation and via se translation to other languages. Uh, it kind of always, e even if you're only interested in writing HDL code, and not implementing the underlying language uh, stack, I think it gives you a deeper understanding of, of the level above it as well. And uh, it's not going to be uh, incredibly difficult as well. Um, anyway, so uh, this part is probably controversial, but um, I guess also unique maybe in a good way. So we'll see how that goes. Um, let's see. Uh, textbook basics. Um, yeah. So how are we doing on time? We've been going 30 minutes. I don't know how long today's stream will be. Um, let me see if there's questions. I have more stuff, but... Someone's asking about straight net, net list, and I assume you mean straight net list in the case of generating output, uh, like the code generator side. Yeah, like straight net list is totally doable. In fact, um, not to sidetrack too much, but when we did, um, I mean, this was some throwaway stuff, but um, like when you're saying straight net list, that can mean different things. Um, because you still need a language to encode it. So there's like, was it EDIF and BDIF and stuff like that. There's different, there's different um, formats for just like flat net lists. You can target a subset of Verilog that's basically a, a, a you know, just a straight net list, like st purely structural code without any high level stuff, or you can target something like this. Um, but of course, it also depends on what's the level of abstraction in the netlist nodes. Like, uh, for example, here, uh, in the, this is a netlist, right? I'm just visualizing it as GraphWiz. In this netlist, um, I'm assuming that things like uh, comparison is a is an operator node that you can just refer to. But um, depending on what you're targeting, you may have to um, you may have to lower this to you know maybe even bit level. Uh, elements like uh, some standard cell library or whatever, um, and we'll be able to do all of those things. Uh, but yeah, like outputting straight netlist is is even easier in most cases than targeting Verilog because when you're targeting Verilog, uh, at least my goal is to generate Verilog code that is fairly idiomatic that doesn't look like too much needlessly like it was generated by a dumb code generator, so that if we have to um, you know for example if I have to debug it in Verilator which is a a simulator for Verilog code that generates C++ code. And if you want to single step that, the generated C++ code that was generated in turn from Verilog that was generated from our language, uh, you want things to, to not be too messy. And so I'm, I'm going to try to keep uh, the Verilog code we generate uh, as close to the source code, uh, as to the original code as possible. And so that's actually going to, kind of like with ION targeting C code, it's going to take some additional work actually. Generating a straight net list is by far the easiest thing. So yeah, we'll be doing stuff like that as well. Um, so, so yeah. Um, I mean, th this is uh, open-ended. I, I should also mention, uh, do fun exercises along the way. Uh, for example, um, 
maybe I should do this sort of further down. I don't want to sort of make a list of it. Um, but like, for example, again, I don't want to necessarily race to the finish. I want to do stuff along the way that, um, uh, I mean, like uh, more or less, like this is sort of undergraduate uh, midterm project type stuff, I guess, or like, you know, st stuff you might assign in an undergraduate class, but uh, we'll, we'll try to do it pretty quick. But like, for example, uh, uh, implemented, like, you know, taking something like a, a game like Pong and implementing it entirely in hardware, meaning, you know, you're not going to write software code um, for Pong. You're going to do, you know, your your VGA display generator is going to be directly driven by something that knows how to draw the paddles and the ball and the score. And you're going to have explicit, you know, state machine uh, HDL code that describes how the game evolves and stuff like that. Um, uh, and uh, one thing I want to do, which I think is a good example of how to do certain kinds of flow control and data flow stuff in hardware, I thought we would do a, a version of TIS-100. I, I did a proof of concept of this a few years ago for fun. Uh, but this is a really fun uh, kind of programming game, which is basically about you have these very meager uh, processors that are connected in this grid and, um, and tiles and, and um, can communicate with their neighbors in this kind of data flow fashion where they, when they read from a neighbor, uh, they, they block until there's data ready. And so there's kind of implicit synchronization through that. And so, you know, implementing uh, kind of simple uh, self-contained projects that can be done in maybe a day or two uh, and showing how that works. Uh, I'm planning to do this stuff along the way. Um, and I think with stuff like, for example, implementing Pong entirely in hardware, um, I remember a long time ago, a lot of the original Atari games were actually done entirely in, quote unquote, entirely in hardware. Like they didn't necessarily, I think there was later a version, a lot of those games were later re-implemented with a microprocessor, but a lot of the original ones were purely done with just, you know, like 74 series logic chips or whatever, just like discrete logic directly. Um, and um, that's, you know, it's it's maybe easier than people think. Like you obviously have to keep things simple, but uh, I think doing stuff like that will be will will maybe be interesting. Um, so I, I plan to do fun projects like that that are not necessarily critical path, but um, might be fun uh, kind of exercises that that feel like real things rather than just you know some sort of abstract uh, homework. Um, so. Uh, I have a bunch of these in my back pocket that I want to do that I've I've kind of done before in in proof of concept form and I think will be pretty cool. Um, so we'll do a bunch of those along the way. Um, let's see here. All right. Um, the um, do I want to start talking about logic design? Um, all right, maybe I'll talk about logic design uh, a little bit. Um, ap approach, uh, think of combinational logic design like a functional programmer. Um, Um, maybe I won't go into that. I kind of wanted to save that for next time. So maybe I'll just, if, if people have questions uh, or I think of other stuff, we'll cover that now. But uh, I, I think that's too big for today. Uh, but but yeah, anyway. Uh, that's what I, uh, the kind of things I plan to cover, not necessarily in this exact order, but basically starting to more really starting with logic design um, and uh, Covering a bunch of the basics, uh, you know, talking about the basic elements. Uh, I think we're not going to one, one thing that, that I'm going to de-emphasize that I think is is pretty boring uh, in the traditional kind of curriculum for this stuff is an overemphasis on Boolean algebra because I think if you're a programmer, you already understand most of that, and also a lot of the emphasis, um, the, a lot of the classical emphasis in logic design books is based on the idea that you have discrete logic gates, like 74 series logic or whatever, and you're kind of minimizing the number of discrete chips and stuff, and which doesn't really correspond very well to um, 
to the modern op optimization criteria. Like you have different, first off, you have different stand, like depending on whether you're an FPGA or whether you're, um, you're, you're designing for ASICs, it's a totally different world. Like on an FPGA, for example, any sex uh, input uh, gate can be realized with essentially the same cost. Uh, and so it's a totally different way of thinking. And I think uh, it, it would actually be more confusing uh, than helpful to spend time too much on traditional Boolean algebra stuff. Uh, and I assume that the basics, like people know what De Morgan's laws are, people know how to manipulate uh, Boolean algebra uh, equations just from doing software. So I won't be spending any significant time on that. I won't be covering like Carnot maps or or that stuff, uh, which uh, for some reason is still pretty prominent seems seemingly in the undergraduate curriculum. So uh, the stuff I'll be covering is really more like, um, I guess a level beyond that. Um, but anyway, yeah, we'll start that tomorrow. Not tomorrow, I guess it's the day after tomorrow. Uh, the, um, what was the other thing I wanted to talk about? Um, yeah, maybe I'll keep it. I'll keep it to this. I don't want to start something and then break it off. Um, yeah, um, let, let's keep it to this for today. I, I, this is a really short stream. I think it's only forty-five minutes, but um, that's probably appropriate for what I have. Uh, sorry, for. Uh, for what I was planning on covering, but yeah. Anyway, if um, if people have questions and, and or ideas or whatever, um, let me know. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it for today. So basic idea of where we're going, um, like starting lo starting with logic design, uh, going over the basics, kind of deciding an HDL that corresponds to those ideas along the way. Um, Moving through, still while still staying in the combinational logic world, uh, doing covering basic uh, data path circuits, um, and stuff like that. Um, and at some point, I mean, it won't take too long, hopefully. But at some point, when I feel like we've covered never the stuff, we'll move to the CPU. Now, the cool thing, by the way, about the, the order in which we did things previously, like we did. Um, you know, we have an assembler and we have a uh, uh, an instruction set simulator for RISC-V already implemented ourselves, means that once we uh, do the CPU bring up, we can basically, we have something to compare it to. We already have an assembler we can use to generate code without using third-party co uh, tools. Uh, we already have another simulator that we can compare to, um, to, the, to the first initial CPU design. And so as we do the bring up and we try to get things working, we can kind of compare things very closely. And so um, that's a heck of a lot easier than s trying to start naked sort of just directly with, uh, you know, with uh, designing a, a CPU and Verilog or whatever, um, if you don't have any background in that. So for us, uh, you know, we already know the instruction set. We've already been programming assembly code for RISC-V. So by the time we do the CPU, we kind of know quote unquote everything about uh, how it should behave more or less and so it's mostly just a matter of uh, of embodying that uh, in a specific design rather than uh, learning how the instruction set works or whatever um, so yeah uh, that that's the idea um, this will probably um, I mean I, I assume this will be at least several months even for the initial phase to to get uh, through some of this stuff and and some of it is elastic we can add or subtract depending on whether uh, uh, people are finding it interesting or people want to uh, or it's going too fast or too slow or whatever but uh, I expect that even this initial phase will will take probably a few months um, and uh, you know the first major milestone, I mean, there will be some, I, I, like I like I said, there will be some fun exercises along the way that will hopefully feel like cool accomplishments. But in terms of like the major major milestone, in terms of the global project roadmap, uh, that will probably occur when we have a you know the simple CPU with uh, UART, and um, we can, for example, we we can run like we can run our fourth uh, we can run our fourth uh, interpreter on it maybe or something like that, um, which is a, a fairly substantial program. Um, 
so so that will be the first major milestone. That will probably be a few months, I guess. Um, but uh, we'll see. But I don't want that to be the only kind of carrot. I, I like I hope for for every step to be fairly interesting. If this is something that uh, that you find compelling, so not 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 just to make a beeline for that, but to do these fun things along the way. And teach about like you know how how does VGA work? How does how do all these things work? Like even UARTs are actually kind of interesting because they're simple but they're asynchronous, right? So how do you sample? How do you do? How do you like given that you run at a different speed from the UART and uh, and you have to deal with clock drift and resynchronizing every byte? Like there's a bunch of very interesting things coming out of even simple topics like UARTs. Like how do you design a UART receiver, for example? Um, so I think all of this should be uh, pretty interesting if you don't have a background in hardware. If you have a background in hardware, I think the stuff that will probably be more interesting will be maybe more on the HDL side because I don't think most people um, maybe know how simple it is to implement an HDL. Uh, I, I think a lot of the other stuff will be old hat to those folks. And so that all these things that are very hardware centric won't maybe be very new. Maybe my approach will be new, but maybe it will be from your perspective, Boris, I don't know. Um, but um, certainly the, the HDL stuff, I think, will be fairly unique. Uh, the fact that we're making our own HD, HDL and our own simulator and all our own tool set around that, uh, that should be new to hardware people, but then everything else should be new to software people. So anyway, um, that's where we're going. So this should be really cool. Honestly, this is kind of like the... the, the not just this initial set of things, but the whole hardware design stuff is really what motivated me to do Bitwise because the other stuff is, uh, you know, it's stuff that if you're kind of a low-level systems programmer, you have more or less a handle on maybe. But uh, what was what really excited me was connecting that to hardware. So you have kind of continuous, you have a continuous understanding of things from, I mean, I won't claim it's truly bare metal, right? But we're probably going to at least do a, a simple switch level simulation so that I can at least show you how you could even build things from transistors uh, and simulate it. Um, not that we'll be doing simulation at that level for day-to-day -day stuff, but you know, like you'll have some understanding of everything from, you know, building things out of, of transistors acting as uh, networks of switches, all the way up to I don't I don't know wherever we end up, right? But um, that that's a pretty a pretty good slice of the stack, I would say that. Uh, um, is the kind of stuff that I would I was interested in when I was younger and and couldn't really find uh, a lot of information on. So, uh, but 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 for me the you know the the really exciting stuff is hardware and hopefully it is for most software people too. So um, this should be the good stuff. But this is also where I'm most inexperienced. So um, I have some fairly new ideas with some of this stuff, but I they, they might be bad ideas. Like if if uh, I'm definitely interested in feedback from from people who are uh, RTL designers uh, and have a lot of, of, of experience in the industry, but uh, I'm not necessarily focusing on that stuff. I'm trying to keep things kind of approachable for software people. But anyway, so that's it for today, I think. <clears throat> and uh, so come back next stream. We will kick off with logic design. We'll just jump right into it. Um, and um, yeah, so that's it. That's it for me. See everyone. Uh, see everyone around.